and he's just about ready to begin his work. But before he starts cleaning the bearings themselves, he lowers his face shield. That protects his eyes from any solvent splashes. Once he's ready to go, he removes the cover from the solvents. You'll notice the tubs on your right and in the middle have clean solvent in them. The tub on your left contains an approved lubricant for the bearings that are going to be cleaned. The worker begins by removing one bearing from its bag. And as he does this, he sets the bag aside. The bag isn't going to be reused because once the bearing is cleaned, it'll be put in a new clean bag. Then he places the bearing and its outer ring in the first tub of solvent and cleans the outer ring. What he's doing here is removing any lubricant residue that's been left on the ring. This cleaning is done to remove any old lubricant and to prepare the ring for a thorough inspection. Once the outer ring has been cleaned and placed in a tub of fresh solvent, he then cleans the inner ring and the cage containing the rollers. He never spins the rollers. That might damage them. Instead, he uses a swirling action to remove any lubricant from the bearing. An anti-friction bearing should never be spun without lubricant in it. Once the lubricant has been cleaned from the rings and the rollers, the bearing is then washed in the second container of solvent. This is done to remove any lubricant residue or grit that may have remained on the bearing after the first solvent bath. Once the outer ring has been thoroughly cleaned with two solvent baths, it's wiped as always with a clean, lint-free cloth so the worker can look for any defects. He performs a thorough visual examination, looking for cracks, nicks, or chips in the ring. Any visible defects would be reason to replace this bearing. When he's satisfied that there are no obvious defects in the outer ring, he places it in the lubricant bath. Then he turns his attention to the inner ring and the rollers. Again, he uses a swirling action to remove any leftover lubricant or grit from the bearing. Once the worker is satisfied that the bearing is clean, he dries off the surface. Again, when he's doing this drying work, he uses a clean, lint-free rag. You'll recall we said earlier that the material you use for wiping bearings has to be free of lint, because lint can contaminate a bearing and possibly cause it to fail. At each step in the cleaning process, the bearing is checked for damage. When it was first removed from the shaft, he looked for any gross defects. With the lubricant removed from the surfaces, he can look for small defects that might have been covered by the lubricant. So he continues wiping and inspecting the bearing till he's satisfied that he's ready to place it in the lubricant. I should point out that the main reason for this lubricant is to function as a preservative. He's not really pre-lubricating the bearing. A coating of lubricant minimizes the possibility of corrosion occurring while the bearing is out of the speed reducer. Once all the parts of the bearing have been placed in the lubricant, he's then ready to functionally inspect the bearing. What do we mean here? Well, he has to assemble the bearing and then test rotate it to see if he feels any resistance. This would indicate flat spots or wear on the rollers or one of the rings. He rotates the bearing slowly. You'll notice when he does this, he doesn't spin the outer ring because he wants to feel for any flat spots. He merely rotates it slowly. What he's doing is feeling for any resistance as the bearing is rolled. If he felt any resistance, it would indicate that either a roller or a ring was damaged. In this case, he doesn't feel any resistance, so this bearing can be reused. Before continuing to the next step, the worker wipes the lubricant from his gloves. This is so he won't spread lubricant around the work table. He might collect grit, and that could damage a bearing. To label the bearing for reuse, he fills out a tag indicating which one he's working with. Remember, he has two different bearings, one from each end of the shaft, so it's very important for him to keep track of where the bearing came from. And he also carefully records the condition of the bearing, which in this case is okay for reuse.
once he's determined the bearing is serviceable and he's filled out the tag identifying the bearing he's working with, he then places the bearing with its tag in a new plastic bag. With the first bearing inspected, he then repeats the cleaning process with the other bearing. That is, he rinses the bearing in the first cleaning bath and then uses the second cleaning bath to make sure all contaminants have been removed. Finally, the bearing is dipped in lubricant before receiving a complete inspection. Once he's finished dipping the bearing in lubricant, he has to reassemble it for a final inspection. But before placing it on the table and completely reassembling it, he makes an initial check because he suspects that this bearing might be damaged. He noticed some rough spots on the rollers as he was cleaning it. Once he's made sure that the inner ring is completely covered with lubricant, he then places the bearing back together. In this case, what he finds is that it's damaged. In other words, he found a rough spot when he rotated the bearing. So he takes it to the warehouse to pick out a replacement. Well, so far we've seen how anti-friction bearings are inspected and cleaned. The worker found an unserviceable bearing, and he's gone to get a replacement. While he's getting that replacement, let's take a break so you can review the cleaning and inspection steps with your instructor. When you come back, the worker will put the bearing back on the shaft. Before we get back to the worker and see how he puts the bearings back on the shaft, let's take a moment to talk about replacement selection. How does the worker select a replacement? In most cases, all that's required is to look at the bearing and find an identifying number and then use that identifying number to order or select a replacement. Well, the worker has selected his replacement for the bad bearing, so let's rejoin him in the shop. Before using the new bearing, he inspects it carefully to make sure it'll work properly. It's not very likely the damage occurred in storage, but the worker wants to be sure that the new bearing is serviceable before he puts it on the shaft. It's going to be a while before he places the bearing on the shaft, so the worker dips it in lubricant to make sure that it's protected. Remember, any rust or pitting could ruin the bearing. To do this, the inner ring is dipped in lubricant, and then checked for any obvious damage that may have occurred in storage. The rollers could be scratched or flattened. Once the inner ring has been inspected and set aside, he then turns his attention to the outer ring. Again, he makes a quick visual check after dipping the ring in lubricant. Then he rotates the inner ring and the outer ring, just as he did when he inspected the other bearings. What he's looking for here is the same thing he looked for when he inspected the other bearings. He's looking for any signs of rough operation. When he's satisfied that the bearing is serviceable, and that it's the proper size and type, he places it in a plastic bag. He's going to keep it there until it's placed on the shaft. Then he fills out another tag identifying where the bearing will be used on the shaft. After that, he inspects the shaft to find out if the bearings will mate properly with it when they're pressed back on. Before cleaning the shaft, he removes the dust covers which were placed on the surfaces of the shaft. These were placed there so that the shaft wouldn't be contaminated while he was doing his work with the bearings. Once the covers are out of the way, he's ready to clean the shaft. He takes a lint-free cloth and a small amount of solvent from the clean bath. He then wipes down the surfaces of the shaft to make sure that any dirt particles have been removed from the portion where the bearings will be mated to the shaft. Then, since he's through with the solvent, he takes off his gloves and his face shield. He's now ready to take his measurements. In our plant, we use manufacturer's instructions, which contain a specification sheet to find the actual specifications for the shaft diameter. After obtaining the dimensions, he records them on a standard check sheet. All the measurements will be recorded and compared against this specified dimension. To do the measuring, he uses an outside micrometer. A micrometer has to be used instead of a veneer caliper because the tolerances given for this shaft are extremely small. So he has to use an instrument which will measure the dimensions to the required accuracy. Several measurements are taken of the area where the bearing will be installed.
he has to be sure that the area is circular. In other words, he wants to be sure that it hasn't become oval-shaped. He also must be sure that there is no taper. So he takes two measurements at right angles to each other to find out if the shaft has become oval-shaped. And he takes several measurements along the surface of the area where the bearing is to be installed in order to make sure that it isn't tapered. It must be one constant diameter. He continues taking measurements and recording them until he's satisfied that the area is of the proper dimension. Once he's satisfied that one end of the shaft is serviceable, he then repeats these measurements on the other end of the shaft. When he's satisfied that both ends of the shaft are still serviceable, he's ready to install the bearings. He first checks the press to make sure that it's properly set up. Then he puts his safety hat, goggles, and gloves back on in case the bearing should suddenly shatter. To press on the bearings, he has to remove them from their bags, but the bearings are only taken out of the bags as they're needed. That way they won't be contaminated. He's going to press on the inner rings, so to get ready for doing this, the inner ring and rollers of one bearing are removed from their bag and set on a lint-free cloth. The outer ring stays in the bag. It won't be needed until the shaft is put back in the speed reducer. The next step is to position the inner ring on the cross blocks, so he places the small tapered end on the blocks. He wants the wider end against the shaft. If it's not installed this way, the bearing won't function properly when the shaft is installed in the speed reducer. Once he's sure the inner ring is positioned against the blocks, the shaft is inserted. It's important to be sure the correct end is put in the bearing. If the wrong end was placed in the bearing, the original alignment of the shaft and its bearing would be disturbed. That could lead to an early bearing failure. It's also important to be sure the shaft is properly aligned with the bearing. The shaft has to be strictly vertical. If it isn't, the shaft could be scored or the bearing could be damaged when he presses the shaft into the bearing. Checking alignment saves time and prevents damage. Since he's going to press the shaft into the bearing, force has to be applied to the end of the shaft. By putting the brass spacer between the shaft and the ram, he prevents flaring the end of the shaft. While installing the spacer, he double-checks the shaft alignment. If he found a problem, he could remove the spacer and correct it. Once everything is in position, he puts a light coating of oil on the shaft. This helps to make the shaft go into the bearing as smoothly as possible. When you do this, be sure to use an oil that's compatible with the lubricant in the bearing. Your facility procedures may list the approved oils for this work. Before pressing the shaft into the bearing, the worker makes a final check to be sure the shaft and bearing are aligned. Then he begins pressing the shaft into the bearing. While this is being done, the worker and his helper watch for any binding of the shaft or misalignment. If they saw a problem, they would stop work, correct the alignment, and then continue pressing the shaft. In this case, they find no problems, so the worker continues operating the press till the shaft stops against the inner ring of the bearing. Once the shaft stops, pressure is relieved on the ram. At this point, the brass spacer is removed and set aside. With the spacer out of the way, the shaft is lifted away from the blocks. While he's pressing on the second bearing and covering the bearings to protect them, let's take a break.